Hi everyone, um, thank you for tuning in. This lecture is about effective prep for strategic cases for 3v3. So there are two goals that I want to achieve through this lecture, or I wish you would kind of grasp through watching the short lecture. Um, the first is understanding the basics on how to come up with, choose, and build, and defend a strategic case. So we'll be talking about what st strategy is, how you should execute it, how you should think about it, and we will specifically focus on a lot of how you should do it during prep, because I think it is the most important thing, especially in the 3v3 debate. Um, the second thing is learning how to make 3% time prep time efficient. So I think a lot of times um, as a team, you might struggle with time management, especially when there are three members and you want to incorporate every single member's ideas into the best speech you can give. I'll be giving tips on how you can do this well as well. So let's get straight into the contents of this lecture. The first thing we'll be starting is with is talking about what strategy is, and specifically what kind of, I guess, strategy we'll be talking about in this um, in this lecture. So first of all, um, a strategy as I see it is foreseeing how a debate would pan out and having a clear vision on the road to victory for your team. So basically this means that when you go into a debate during prep time, you already kind of understand what kind of debate this is going to become, what the other side is going to say, how you're going to respond to those cases, how you're going to build your cases, and that as a whole becomes a package of, of strategy. Um, I think the most important, I guess, um, point here is that um, when you have a strategy going into a debate, you aren't surprised by what happens in the debate, and most likely um, you should be able to kind of deal with everything um, in a way that all members of the team already understand. Um, and I think uh, the thing that is important here is that strategy is something that should be decided in prep, understood by every single member of the team and executed throughout the four speeches from first to reply. So a lot of the times I get questions, especially from people that often do second speakers or whip speakers as to how they can come up with responses or how they're going to, I guess, necessarily manage themselves within a debate. Um, the biggest answer I have to this is that although, of course, a lot of, I guess, prep and drilling um, and practices around building responses and building um, tracking, for example, is important. I think a lot of the ability for second speeches and whip speeches to be exceptional in 3v3 debates comes a lot out of what is already done in prep. So in prep, from the first speaker, um, uh, from prep, the first speaker should have a I guess, constructive speech that is already responsive to the other side. The second and with members should know how to weigh their case above the potential likely arguments that comes about from the other side. And I think this framework is something that every single speech should keep in mind. So I'm going to start explaining how you build good strategy and how you, I guess, use prep time to maximize the efficiency of your strategy by going through the prep time in chronological order. So I think Obviously, the way in which prep time is used differs from team to team, but I think the overall structure in which you would think about cases should be kind of the same. So the way I'll be explaining this is firstly, is about reading the motion and understanding it. Secondly, would be brainstorming about the debate, which most of the time happens indiv individually. Thirdly, is after you share those individual ideas, you go on to choosing which case you're going to run. Um, fourthly, I think this is something that might be a bit specific. It is about confirming what kind of strategy you're going to be running. Fifthly, you'll be building the case that you decided you're going to be running. And then um, as the time progresses, you would also like to allocate time to building responses. Um, even though this might be a minimal time within prep time, I think it is important for um, there to be existing, pre-existing room for um, speak, for especially for latter speakers to be able to think of responses as well. The first thing that I really want to emphasize is that reading the motion is extremely crucial. And I think a lot of people do not regard this in, as important enough. Um, so a lot of times you just read a motion, you get straight into brainstorming. Before you go into that brainstorming step, it is important for you to read the motion carefully and to know that you understand the motion um, as it should be debated in around. Um, there's a few points here that I think are important. The first thing is that the words in the motion really matter. Um, firstly, in terms of motion type, things like this house would motions that are policy motions, this house preferred motions, this house believes that motions, this has as motions that are active motions, all of these have different 
burdens that are placed on teams to be able to fill. Um, and the debate changes wildly based on the motion type. Don't have a general grasp of what the motion is trying to talk about, have a specific understanding of what the motion is targeting. The second thing is reading the specific words that activate the motion very specifically. Um, a lot of common examples of this is when a motion talks about this house regrets the rise of, this house supports the rise of something. In that instance, um, when you have a motion, this house supports the rise of X, you aren't talking about whether X itself is good or not. You're talking about whether the rise of X is a good thing or not. So that kind of word can significantly change the way a debate should function. And for you to be able to understand that before you even start brainstorming any ideas is extremely crucial. Thirdly, adjectives also play an important part. For example, if a motion says heavily subsidize, it isn't just about doing some subsidization, it's about heavily subsidizing. There's a burden placed on government side to prove why this should be done heavily and impacts arise from those adjectives as well. We should be taking that into account. Um, first of all, just read the motion, know that you understand this, be careful and specific about what the motion is saying. The second thing that is important is to imagine the comparative. I think this is one of the most important things, one of the most underrated skills in debating, um, especially as a beginner, is when you kind of imagine the debate in a vacuum, whereas the debate is always going to be a comparison of two different scenarios, one in which the motion exists, one in which the motion doesn't, or one in which the policy is implemented, one of which is not. Um, in any scenario, it's two different worlds being compared. It is always, always, always important to accurately understand what the comparative in the debate is going to be. There is a few different ways to think about this. The first thing is thinking about what the likely comparative is. So when you imagine this house supports the rise of something, for example, what is the likely comparative? Is it a world in which this has never existed? Or is this a world in which this is somewhat popular, for example? This changes the debate significantly. And the second fact that you want to think about is what is the advantageous comparative for either side? So I think there is a strategy in which you can weaponize talking about the comparative in a way that makes it advantageous for your side. Um, sometimes this can be done um, in strategic ways in 3B3. Um, imagine what the comparative is, understand what the debate is comparing. It's very important. Um, the third thing that you want to do as you just read the motion is imagine the debate in high resolution. Um, as I think this is many times boiled down to things like characterization of specific words that exist in the motion, or understanding real world examples that come, that come up um, as a result of what this motion is talking about. Um, when AC members, you know, CAP members set motions, a lot of the times that motion is rooted in something that has existed in the real world. Um, I think even if the motion, motion is not specifically worded to talk about a phenomenon in the world, a lot of the times, obviously, AC members get their inspiration for motions from watching the news, from reading about different articles, for example. So it is likely that this is talking about something in the real world that has happened. Um, Therefore, um, obviously, this just points to the fact that it's important for you to be able to input different amounts of different, um, you know, information for you to be able to debate well. But also, this just means when you read a motion, you want to think about the intentions behind how the AC member set AC member set that motion, and to be able to imagine it in real life. Once you read the motion and you know for sure that you understand the motion and the comparative and the characterization. You move on to brainstorming the ideas of what things you can run, et cetera. Um, I think there are two things that necessarily has to be done when you brainstorm. And I do this in the order that is written here. The first thing I do is talk about what, think about what is the most intuitive case for my side. Most of the time, the strongest case in a debate is not the very, very tricky, complicated case that you would think of after doing five mental gymnastic um mental gymnastics. It is the case, it is the idea that a person would think about when you ask a person on the street about the motion. It is the most intuitive thing that any person in the world can think about. It's most likely the strongest case for your side. So just firstly, imagine that. Write that down. Know that you have that set in stone. The second thing that I think is important to think about, especially when we're talking about strategy, as we're doing in this lecture, is you want to think about what the other side is going to say and how you can win that point for your side. I think this is crucial to think about for every single member of the team. Um, even if you're doing first speaker, a lot of the times I see teams separating on one person thinks about gov side, one person thinks about op side. I don't think this is how it should work. Every person should be thinking about either side of the debate so you know which arguments come up 
how they're going to clash and how you're going to win. So when you think about what the other side is going to say, there's a few ways you're going to utilize those ideas to be able to win the debate. The best case is that you're going to build a case that clashes with that impact and flips it for your side. So what you want to do is if they're going to say they're going to achieve X, you want to say you achieve X better. That's the best thing you can do. If you can find a way to do that, you run that as an argument. The second thing is if you cannot work out a way for you to be able to flip that impact, what's going to happen is you're going to have to mediate that case and weigh against it. So this is going to be the kind of framework you want to have. The best case you flip, if you can't, you mediate and weigh. I'm going to talk about an example of a round that I had recently. So the motion for this round and in the info slide was demisexuality is a sexual orientation where individuals experience sexual attraction only after developing strong emotional bond or connection with someone. Um, so it's uh, about de demisexuality. The motion was behind a veil of ignorance. This house prefers to be born a demisexual. I was on opposition side. So as you're brainstorming, the first thing you're going to think about is the most intuitive case for your side. Um, I think there's a few obvious intuitive cases here. The first one being is just that you're going to feel ostracized. You're going to feel isolated. You might also feel that there is something weird and wrong about you because you're a minority uh, sex you have a minority sexuality. Um, when you're talking, for example, around your peers about things like, um, you know, your love life, for example, you might feel that something is weird and wrong about you. That I think is a very intuitive impact. Another thing I think is just that when you are a demisexual, it is just significantly difficult, or more difficult for you to be able to find a partner because um, many times the development of relationships happen through the sexual connection. You aren't able to, you know, comfortably form that type of connection, making it difficult for you to be able to form relationships. I think that's another pretty intuitive impact. I think another intuitive impact maybe for upside is to say that, you know, sexual uh, sex in and of itself is very enjoyable for you to be able to miss out on that when you cannot have, you know, like fun, casual sexual relationships. That might also be something that is extremely, you know, you know, that, that might also be an impact that you can claim on upside. That's the intuitive cases I think that I had or that I measured at the beginning. Next, you're going to think about what the gov side is going to say. I think the most intuitive gov case that I imagined is that when you're born as a non-demisexual, as um, a person with sexual attraction, um, the way I would characterize it from gov is to say that this sexual attraction is extremely strong. It is likely to blind you of making rational calculuses and choices about um, your relationships. And therefore, you're going to, one, go into relationships um, more like, you know, in a stupid way, you're going to form relationships with people that you find hot, but aren't necessarily likely to be, you know, compatible with you. You're also likely to stay in these relationships for longer when you're blinded by this and you're likely to fall into patterns of things like, you know, toxic relationships or in the worst cases, things like abuse, for example. And therefore, when you have, de when you are demisexual, you're able to rationally calculate what kind of people you want to meet. You're likely to have a happier life. You're less likely to have divorces, for example. That's like, I think, the most intuitive gov case that you can think about. Um. So when I have these laid out, I think about how my case interacts with the other side and how I might have to think about an, for a few more examples or arguments, not examples, arguments that can beat the other side. So I think when you think about how Gov is forming their argument, their argument is that relationships are worse for um, non-demisexual people. You achieve better relationships. I think the way I would want to run this or want to kind of beat this case is by flipping it because I think that's possible. Um, I think the way you, I can flip it is to say that one, as I was mentioning before, because it is difficult for you to enter a relationship as a demisexual, this necessarily means that one, you have less options of people you can choose from, meaning that you're less likely to meet someone that is relatively more compatible with you. Two, that because you lack like experience, you're far more likely to fall into like harmful relationships when you do not understand your interests best or you aren't able to advocate for yourself in a necessarily good way. Or three, that because you fear so much that you're not likely to find another partner when you leave this relationship, you're so more likely to stick to harmful relationships and make them worse. For example, I think these things, for example, could flip the gov claim there and try to and you kind of want to run those arguments. What I would do is just run this from first. Um, I think this is a constructive case in and of itself. So I'll run that from first to make sure it clashes the other side. Um, maybe another gov argument might be to say that, you know, when uh, kind of just as a general intuition that things like hookup culture is bad because it might lead into, um, you know, issues of uh, you know, when you aren't comfortable with another person and you're in a sexual context with them, that might be harmful. 
Um, I think something that I might be able to say from opposition is to say that when you are a demisexual, it is more likely what you're likely to enter into um, sexual situations with other people when you do not want to because you have an intuition or you kind of want to force yourself to think that you are not a demisexual, that you have sexual desires. Other people might also tell you that you just haven't found the right person yet. And those kind of intuitions push you to go into even more uncomfortable like situations. I think that might be something I could run to be able to kind of flip that case as well. Um, so this is the kind of framework of thinking you want to have. You think about the intuitive case for your side, you think about what the other side says, and think about ways you can flip it. If you can't, you think about ways to mediate and weigh against it. So next, once you brainstorm, the next thing you're going to do is choose which case you're going to run. So everyone brainstorms, you share ideas, and you're going to choose the case. Um, I think in terms of choosing the case as a strategy, there are, I guess, just two different vectors that you're going to want to consider. The first is how easy is the mechanism to prove um, and how hard is it for the other side to respond to? Um, sometimes cases are extremely easy. There's just one mechanism, one direct impact connected straight from the motion. Sometimes you have to build um, a lot of different reasons as to why an actor might work this way. Uh, those reasons might not be as intuitive. That is the kind of um, idea we're talking about here. Um, the second thing is how strong itself is the impact. Um, the important thing to note here is that in most debates and most motions, these two are necessarily a trade-off. When there is a huge impact, for example, a lot of people are dying, a lot of people are suffering, um, these kinds of impacts tend to be just hard to prove because you have to prove the extent of the mechanism to say that this huge impact is going to happen. Um, on the comparative, many times, you know, smaller impacts, like how a person might feel, like um, smaller impacts on individual levels, this might be an easier impact to prove. However, you know, obviously there's this idea about how important is that impact when weighed against an infinitely stronger impact, it might not be as effective. Um, when you think about this trade-off and choosing your case, I think the like intuitive way to imagine this is to kind of think about what type of motion you're actually talking about. Um, how much strength does that motion itself yield? So there's different types of motions that we do in debates. Sometimes the motions are just things like narrative motions when it's about the glorification of X. Sometimes it's about the government banning something or the government forcibly doing something. Obviously, those two motions have different amounts of power that they're yielding. It is important for you to have an intuition on how strong the motion that you're debating is and for your mechanisms and impacts to align with that motion. It is significantly difficult for you to build a everyone dies argument in a narrative motion and most times it's just not strategic to do so so this is something that you should train over time to be able to think about what is an adequate impact for a motion that you're debating and that is the way you can kind of strategize more effectively so once you choose the case you want to confirm the strategy a lot of this confirming the strategy is going to revolve around the ideas that we went through during brainstorming, where we think about what the other side is going to say and how we're going to weigh against those impacts. So basically, as we said, if the other side is going to say um, something where your impact is shared, obviously what you're going to be um, you know, arguing on is the mechanism. If both sides want X, if you can do X better, you win the debate. Um, then what you want to do is focus your time and effort into proving the mechanism. Sometimes, um, on the other hand, the impact might be different from either side. One side is trying to prove this, the other side is trying to prove a different impact. Then what becomes important is obviously the mechanism is always important, but also you need to prove why the impact itself is going to matter. And that is the kind of um, strategy mind thinking that you need to have even before you start building your case. The other thing you want to think about is the weighing for your case. Obviously, this is going to tie into the idea about how impacting is important. But I think weighing sometimes in many in many debates happens way too late. Um, I don't think weighing is something that should happen at whip speaker or reply speaker. Um, I think even at deputy, it's a bit too late. Weighing should be something that every team member has in mind. That is something that obviously I think um, you think about in prep, but also something that you build during first speaker you know, in the ideal case as well. Um, let's talk about an example of confirming strategy here. 
So this is also a motion I've done recently. Um, the info slide says, you are a devout member of a religious organization whose beliefs and teachings diverge from societal norms, often labeled as a cult. Upon the retirement of the current leader, you've been appointed to succeed them and assume the role of guiding the community forward. So you're now a cult, a new, a newly appointed cult leader. The motion says this house would openly reinterpret the sacred text of this religion to better align its beliefs and teaching with societal norms. I was on opposition side of this motion. So again, what is opposition side going to say? I'm first going to think about the intuitive uh, arguments that opposition side can run. Um, I think there is mainly two things. The first thing is the fact that you yourself is a devout member of this religion, probably likely from the fact that you're appointed as a cult leader, necessarily means that diverging from the rules of this religion in and of itself is likely to create a inner dissonance that is so that when you're advocating for something that is against the core beliefs that you have to begin with. I think that's an argument that can all can run. Um, a second argument that I would have is to say that this is likely to create turmoil and backlash from within the religious community when the religious community has set in stone values that probably the previous leader has, um, you know, set in stone. When you go against that, there's likely to be backlash against you from the community. This is bad because it might challenge your power. You know, another leader might be able to take your spot. There might be divisions within the religion. You know, the fact of losing believers that have faith in you in and of itself might be an impact as well. That's the kind of intuitive case I have for side opposition. So then I imagine what side government is going to say. Um, I think what government might be able to say is that because these beliefs and teachings diverge so much from societal norms, it is likely that this is, number one, leading to society creating a lot of backlash against this cult. And um, you want society to be on your side when you reinterpret the text and say that this is something that is um, more moderate and more in line with societal values, you're likely to get them on your side. You're less likely to get backlash as a leader, but also backlash against your cult members as well. I think the second thing that I might be able to say is that man, many times these teachings diverging from societal norms in and of itself might cause harm to believers. For example, this might be just that if you have violent, um, like if you, if the, um, like, you know, religious organization is encouraging violence. This might lead to believers getting arrested. Um, this means that this just causes harms onto believers themselves. But also it might just lead into, like, for example, government prosecution against the cult, for example, and these things can weaken the cult in and of itself. Um, so how would I kind of strategize my cases in alignment to this? So in terms of the first argument that government side might run about societal um, acceptance, I think it is difficult for me from opposition side to flip this impact and say that societal acceptance happens more on our side, considering the fact that we're probably going to still be pursuing the beliefs and texts that are um, kind of not in alignment with societal values. I also don't think that I want to mediate my case by saying we're going to do it moderately because I think that would also take down a lot of our chunk of our case. So I'm going to take a hard stance and say that we're just going to continue what we've always done. And the way I'll be dealing with the first government case is to, is to um, cut down on the mechanisms. Um, first, I'll just mediate the fact that it's probably unlikely that society is going to accept you more. Considering the fact that you're a cult, a lot of people still perceive you as a cult. You're unlikely to have things like a lot of media presence or positive media presence anyway. A lot of people might remember facts about you in the past that are necessarily traumatic or dramatic. Um, in general, your like impression as a cult is not going to change. And therefore, I would probably try to cut down on the mechanisms of that as much as possible. Second, I'll try to then weigh this against our case to say that, you know, um, being society accepted necessarily is not that important for especially for members within the cult that have chosen to belong in this cult um especially just because probably they joined this cult because they knew it was a cult um they also probably joined maybe especially because it diverged from societal norms maybe because it promoted um sentiments that are against societal values that's exactly why a lot of people chose this cult um therefore i would try to like mediate and weigh against the fact that the societal acceptance argument does not matter as much as the inner community argument, for example, as a cult leader having a position of power. On the second idea about things like um, the fact that this belief might cause um, 
like harm to these individuals. I think the first, I guess, strategy I would have to this is that this actually is good for members within this religion to claim that a lot of these practices that are done within these cults are specifically what was chosen by these members to do. And therefore, um, going against this might actually harm these members and their beliefs is how I guess I would try to flip that claim in and of itself. I think there's also other ways to weigh this as well, but I think that's the most important way that we can think about. So again, this is kind of what you want to do during confirming strategy. You think about your most intuitive cases. So we have those set in stone. We think about the other side's cases and we think about a way to flip them. If we can, we run that as an argument. If we can't, we think about a good strategy of mitigating and weighing against that case. So once you decide your strategy, once you confirm which cases you're going to run, you're going to want to be building your cases. Um, I think there's just important, um, I think this is not a lecture on building cases, but there's just two things I want to mention, especially in terms of strategy. The first thing is just thinking about the burdens of the case Very important is very important. Um, burdens is what you need to prove for an argument to stand. And burdens should always connect the emotion to the impact, meaning that um, a lot of times I think I see speeches where emotion is not directly connected to the mechanism. So there's a jump there, especially in things like softer motions and things like narrative motions. Um, there's an assumption that is made a lot of times in speeches where uh, people's minds drastically change without any mechanization connecting the emotion to that mechanism. It's very difficult for a judge to buy that. Or when there's mechanisms tied in and then there's a grand impact at the end where it is difficult for me to believe why the mechanism has the extent of building to that impact. So connecting these is always important. Um, think of who does what. I think incentive and capacity is a good thing to think about. Uh, most times mechanisms are someone doing something. So think about why that someone has an incentive and capacity to do that thing and explain that is very crucial. The second thing important, important thing I want to mention here is that um, a lot of times, um, this was something that I also... Um, miserably failed at in the past was when I think about cases I just like think about all the ideas jot them down and run them so the way I would be thinking about is um, my ideas would be forming what I'm going to say I think that is not the way you should do it um, before you start actually thinking about mechanisms filling those gaps in what you should be thinking about is which part needs the most explanation and strategically placing your responses, uh, sorry, your mechanisms in those places where actual explanation is needed. Um, I think this is something that is easily done when you already have a strategy set in stone. So when you've already thought about the other side's case, um, as we just did in the previous slide, we know what the other side is going to run. We know what's going to be contentious. We know how the other side is likely to characterize something. We know what the impacts the other side is going for. Then you know what is going to be contentious. If it is characterization that is going to be contentious, you want to run that. You want to give lots of reasons there. Whereas something else that might not be contentious, you don't need that many reasons for. If it is something like, um, you know, the efficacy of the policy being the contentious, you want to run there. If it's the existence of the problem that is going to be questioned, you want to run cases there. Um, think about what is going to be contended. Run important reasons there. Don't spend time explaining things that are you know, obviously going to be conceded by the other side. Once you build your case, I think this is a sh um, this might depend on team to team, but ideally, I think there should be a bit of time allocated for the pro probably the first speaker to write their own speech. But while doing that time, for the latter speakers to be able to build responses that are a bit more specific than what we've done right now already. Um, again. When building your responses, the same thing applies. The priority is to flip the other side. When you cannot, you mediate and weigh. Um, when you think about the way you're going to weigh these responses, I, uh, weigh your case, I think it is very convenient to have a common set of metrics that you can use for weighing. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, um, you know, lectures and stuff that cover this as well. But um, know what kind of metrics you can use for weighing and have that set in mind so you can use them. Uh, there's common things like, you know, like certainty, proximity, stuff like that. Um, the way I guess latter speakers do um, speeches in 3v3 is that you should already have a shared understanding of the main way in which you're going to take the other side's case down and the way you're going to work in newer material within the debate is when you're adding things like specific responses to mechanisms that they have given within the debate. 
Obviously, I don't think you should take time and prep imagining the different mechanisms and the specific ways in which the government side or the other side is going to run their case, because obviously it's going to be different from what you're going to imagine. There's a million ways a case can be built using different reasons. So don't spend time thinking about how to respond to those specific reasons, but have a main route of way, which burden you're going to take down, that kind of linearity is something that you should be imagining during prep. Whereas when you go into the debate, you want to be very specific. They said these reasons. You don't need to take every single reason down. That's probably not possible because of time. But um, the most important reasons, you want to directly attack them, directly challenge them. That's the kind of work you're going to be doing during the debate. Um, the other thing, I guess, is if there's an unexpected case coming out from the other side, you want to respond to that and obviously add to that during the debate. Um, there's two patterns of this happening. One is you misread the motion, you kind of messed up during prep, and the other side has a good case that is something that you did not anticipate. You want to reduce the amount of times this happened as much as possible. It does happen, but in those cases, you deal with it. The second scenario that I think becomes more likely in the long term is that the case was unexpected because it's not a good case. So when there is a surprising case coming out from the other side, um, most likely it's something that's unintuitive. You might, might want to gut check it. If the mechanism is run well, probably it's a good case. But if it's not, there's a chance you can easily weigh against it. So I think that's the way you should be using your brain. Next, we're just going to be moving on to framework of time during a 30-minute prep session. Um, first of all, veto is five minutes. Um, next, you're going to do the brainstorming time individually about three to five minutes. Um, I think one thing that is important is that Taking individual time to brainstorm necessarily is very important when you yourself can think about the debate without the influence of your teammates. I think there is likely to be ideas that come up uh, that are important or intuition checks that come up that is important during this time, because once you start sharing your ideas with each other, you probably all have a similar mindset of how the debate is going to revolve. And when you get that wrong, that might be something that is going to make great trouble in, in later down the line. When you think about it individually, you have three eyes checking on whether the intuitions you have about the debate is actually true or not. So I think that's important. Um, once you do that, next you're going to share, decide the case and strategy. As we were talking about, this is the time where you're going to share, be sharing your ideas and deciding the case. Um, I think what is something that is important here is that even if you don't think you have the perfect case, being able to set a time deadline for when you decide the case is kind of crucial. When you drag on, especially when you have difficult motions, um, when you drag on the time you're kind of thinking about which case to run, the less time you have to actually build that case. And many times when you don't understand a motion too well, the other side is also not going to understand a motion too well. That means that um, spending time thinking about what case you're going to run is not going to be effective for you. You have to choose a case and run it. So you're gonna you're better off spending time making that case good. So that's what I think is important for you to have a deadline, time deadline for that. Then you build a case. Then ideally you have individual time to do response prep and for the first speaker to be able to, you know, make their speech, um, f uh, you know, f finesse their speech. Um, the time fractions of this is obviously different depending on team. And that's why I don't have a set in stone time analysis here. That's something you should be practicing and getting better at amongst your team. But this is just a broad framework. And when you add this all up in the max, it's going to like exceed 30 minutes. So you have to make it shorter and more concise. Um, This is the last thing I'm going to talk about. This is just tips on having efficient prep. I think we've already worked out a framework on having um, how you're going to do prep. And I think that is just the obvious first step to having efficient prep is knowing how you're going to run your prep, what ideas you're going to be sharing now, what is going to be happening next. That's a framework you should have set um, with your teammates. I think that's the most... If we biggest way you can make your proposition, but other than that, um, firstly, I think when you share your ideas, it is important that you organize them. So many times you have an individual, um, individual brainstorming time, and then after that you share your ideas amongst the three of you. Um, when you share these ideas, it is extremely difficult for the discussion to evolve smoothly when you're uh, throwing out a bunch of random ideas here and there. Um, the way you can do this is two things. The first thing is numbering your ideas before you share them. So even if it's just a random numbering, say first they have this, second they have this, three thing, third they have this, this makes it really easier for other team members to be like, oh, let's just discuss around your first point. This, let's discuss around your second point. So just number them. Um, the second thing I think you should do is um, be very clear about what you are talking about 
and what kind of material you're giving or the type of material that you're sharing. So is what you're talking about a mechanism? Is what you're talking about a new impact? Is what you're talking about a response to the other side or an anticipated case for the other side? Is it a characterization? Um, label what you are going to be saying so that we all know what you're going to be saying. Um, the other thing is when you share your ideas and you don't know something or you don't understand something or you're not clear about something, also share that as well. So when you say, I think this is what we can run. However, I'm unclear about this mechanization of this case. Or you can say, the other side is probably going to run this. I'm not sure how to respond to it or flip it, but I do know how to weigh, to weigh against it. So um, share your ideas, but also share what you don't have, because that allows you to move the discussion on forward. The second biggest thing is just because you have three people, it becomes difficult for the you know discussion to ma stay managed. Um, I think it's important to have a moderator that the controls the discussion. Um, the moderator does not have to be the same in every round. Um, the moderator might depend on the motion. My moderator might depend on the way your power dynamics of your team work. So that's something that you should be able, you should be practicing and working out. But it is important, I think, just to have a person that works like this because um, you can manage your discussion a lot better when a person like this is there. Um, you should always have a shared understanding on what is being discussed at the moment. So are you discussing strategy? Are you discussing responses against the other side? Are you discussing mechanisms for your second case? Are you discussing mechanisms for the third point of your second case? Like this is the kind of framework that you want to be sharing because when you go back and forth, it's going to become messy. You're going to end up wasting time and you're also going to not be coming up with the best ideas because your crap was not um, managed well enough. So this ends my presentation here. I hope you've learned a few things about strategy and about prep. Um, three, uh, UADC is a very important tournament for a lot of people. I hope you guys stay well, stay hydrated, um, get good prep, and have an amazing time at UADC. Bye, guys.